So the dinner is over and you're debating, do I want an espresso? Do I want a coffee drink? No, I think we all want some more wine. What do we want for an after dinner drink? Sherry, port, uh, late harvest, ice wine. Tonight, we're going to break it all down on some of the selections. And we do it with the director of hospitality from one of the most picturesque estates in all of Napa Valley. SIP episode 149 begins now. <music> Ladies and gentlemen, if this is your first sip, you picked a good one because this is dessert wine sip, but it's also sip number 149. So shame on you for missing 148 previous episodes. Uh, my name is Martin Cody, co-founder and host this evening of Cellar Angels. As I mentioned, this is sip. Uh, this is where we get together because if it's Friday, sip happens. Uh, and it's also a bunch of things that we like to say on Cellar Angels. We drink serious wines without taking ourselves too seriously. Uh, we're going to talk tonight about ice wines. I'm sorry, dessert wines, ice wines being one of them. But I do want to talk to you a little bit about dessert wines before we bring on tonight's guest. So let me show you what we're talking about here from a Cellar Angels perspective. Dirt, dessert wines, I think, get a little bit of a bad rap because show of hands, who has ever brought a dessert wine to a restaurant? Okay, one person. Uh, I've never bought a dessert wine to a restaurant and I've bought hundreds of wines to restaurants. So that means I must be missing something. Uh, so let's take a look at some more common types of essentially after dinner dessert wines. So you have late harvest. This is what we're going to be talking about this evening uh, with Pete. It's a late harvest wine uh, that is exceptional. I have some of my glass right now and you can see late harvest because these grapes, these are usually picked a month or so or a month or two after the regular harvest. They're all shriveled up. We're going to get into that. There's also ice wines, a very, very popular after dinner drink uh, where the grapes are typically frozen uh, on the vine. Then you've got port. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, these grapes. This looks like a perfect cluster, right? Uh, could be a perfect cluster. So what happens to port to make it port? And then obviously you've got the big daddy, the boy tried us. Uh, you think Chateau de Kim, for example, is probably the most famous uh, noble rot wine in the world. Uh, also one of the most expensive. So tonight we're going to be talking all about that. And if you haven't navigated yourself over to the Cellar Angels website, I would encourage you to do that because uh, unbeknownst to me, this evening, there is just one bottle left of the wine that we're going to be talking about so when you go over to the Cellar Angels website and click on Shop Wines, it's right here. So this little bad boy that Pete and I are going to be discussing because he's the director of hospitality, knows far more about this than I am. There's only one. So if you want to have some nostalgia, some memorabilia of this last wine, and I say last wine because Davis Estates isn't making anymore. This was their last vintage. This puppy's nine years old already and is tasting fantastic. So I bet that will be gone in moments. All right, speaking of how to assess, how to select, how to serve, how to host and what to pick, let's bring on tonight's guest who knows far more about this than I do and is this evening's subject matter expert. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Pete Holes. The crowd goes wild. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm excited to geek out with some fellow wine nerds and uh, talk all things vino. So appreciate everyone's time. Awesome. And for those of you that have not been to this estate behind me, shame on you. Uh, it is incredible uh, in Calistoga. You definitely, I'm going to show some stuff on Google Earth later to kind of give you some exact location of where it is. But boy, get yourself up Valley and see this estate. It's nothing, and Pete can talk about it. From my perspective, and I've been to, as you can imagine, in quite a few wine estates around the world, nothing was overlooked here. Uh, everything was chosen specifically for its purpose and nothing was overlooked. It's incredible. But Pete, I want to start with you and kind of, you know, you look younger, uh, much younger. You, you've grown up kind of in this industry. So talk to us a little bit about where you grew up uh, and then kind of how your little bit of your wine journey. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Sacramento, uh, which is only about an hour and 10 minutes from at least downtown Napa, from where I'm sitting at right now, maybe an hour and 40 minutes. But um, 
my journey in wine kind of goes back to, I would say, high school, um, you know, <laughs> illegally drinking, maybe, uh, you know, finding parents wine uh, in, you know, but the pantry and whatnot. The ironic thing is um, all those people's wine that, you know, somehow got consumed were not my parents' wine. Uh, my parents did not drink, which is kind of funny and ironic because uh, I've been in the wine business now almost 20 years. <laughs> But um, it all kind of started, I was at in a coffee shop working a high school job, and one of my regulars came in and he said, you're so good at service, uh, would you like to make more money and come work in my fine dining restaurant? And my parents were school teachers, and I was born on mac and cheese and peanut butter and jelly, not with a lot of funds to do fine dining, and so it was definitely a eye-opening experience for me. Um, if anyone's familiar with Northern California, a little suburb of Sacramento is called Fair Oaks and this winery, um, or excuse me, this restaurant was a, a fine dining. They were Michelin recommended. It was called uh, Slocum house and mm. French, uh, restaurant. And I was a busser. And so, you know, going around to all these tables, not serving yet, cleaning up everything, everyone tended to leave just a little bit of wine in their bottle and, you know, as a 18, 19 year old kid, um, taking that to the busing station, not putting it in the recycle case, but putting it off to the side and, uh, you know, hate to say it, but uh, dipping into those wines, you know, after all the management had left. That's kind of where I got my first sip of like, wow, this is good, you know, and growing up what we were drinking, of course, what everyone drinks in in high school and early college is either what people will buy you beer pong keggers uh for <laughs> me mad dog two for five you know two for oh, three boy. on sale um so i realized like wow this is some really nice nice stuff um this tastes good i was never really exposed to fine wine and then i asked the gm of the restaurant how do i make more money and he said well if you learn the wine list you can serve and in California, you can serve wine being 18, not necessarily just 21. Um, and so I started kind of studying, wanted to become a server. And then pretty much at 21, um, I just kind of fell in love. I, I was taken under a wing of our lead bartender. And he said, you have the pizzazz, you have the energy. Let's teach you about cocktails. And uh, I was doing business management in college, kind of this is a three, four year thing. And I kind of got to that second accounting class and hated it. If you oh, guys yeah. remember. Oh yeah, I, I, I got to the first one and hated it. <laughs> well, the second one is take everything you learned in the first one and forget it and do it opposite. And I was like, this is terrible. Um, do you still, I, do you still I, remember the, uh, the class title? Mine was BA210. Oh, uh, mine was just managerial accounting. And- oh. uh, uh, the, hair, exactly. the hair in my arms just went up on how much I didn't like that clothes. Exactly. So um, I kind of hated it. I went to my guidance professor and I said, I'm not liking this old business management major I got into. And he said, well, what are you passionate about? And I said, well, don't make fun of me. Uh, and he's like, what do you mean? And he goes, I just love my job. I'm a server at a fine dining restaurant and I'm learning about food and wine, but I know you can't make any money doing that. And he said, what do you... Like, no, what are you talking about? You're yeah. so sadly mistaken. And and I said, well, what, like, you can't do food and wine for a living and like make money. <laughs> I said, oh, you don't realize what happens an hour and a half away yeah. from us. Yeah, there's a little school over here at Davis that would beg to differ. Right, right. But I, I was never really like super smart in science. And a lot of the the famous winemakers, they go to UC Davis for analogy, for winemaking. Right. What I was really good at, um, I was a theater kid growing up. So theater kid, I was, I was a natural kind of salesman. I have no problem talking in front of hundreds of people, especially about things I'm passionate about. And I always have really good kind of energy. You know, I can, I can get up, I can talk, I can, you know, put on a show for people and, and selling wine and, and, and managing a winery and managing a brand. It's kind of like you're performing. Um, mm -hmm. So he said, I know people in the wine business, I can get you a job, you know, once you graduate um, and you, you know, you get done with this. And so literally the weekend after I graduated, 
Well, first of all, I switched my major from business management to hospitality management, which is one of the easier majors. I say it's major <laughs> how to be nice to people. Yeah, it's a it's a good major. Yeah. And 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 so I had, you know, I went from managerial accounting to having classes on Disney and ski resorts and, you know, luxury uh, island retreats. And I was like, oh, this is way more up my alley to things that I'm passionate about. So switch my major uh, and I got placed or uh, my guidance counselor said, I got a job for you in the wine business. And I started working in Amador County, which is in the foothills uh, on the way to Tahoe, kind of from Sacramento. There's a couple mm-hmm. regions out there, El Dorado County, Amador County, and kind of an up and coming wine region with a lot of Zinfandel, Barbera, you know, it's kind of a warmer weather. So where, so Amador is just for people to get kind of their bearings, uh, east of San Francisco and south or where is it south of the East Bay? Where is it? Pretty much dead east. So if you take Highway 80, which kind of takes you from uh, San Francisco to Chicago eventually, but if you right. pass Sacramento and you kind of keep going, uh, okay, it's just kind of south uh, of where I-80 cuts across. But if you take a kind of, you know, the longitude or latitude, whatever the up and down one is, uh, straight over, it's pretty uh, equal to San Francisco, but- Got it. Uh, Sierra Nevada foothills, like our chat uh, person just said. It's Dahlia, beautiful, yep. Up and coming, but uh, I was managing, okay, so I worked there for about a year, uh, and then they gave me the management position, and I was working at a place called Villa Toscano that made 17 Zinfandels, and- 20 wines, 17 Zinfandels, and there's something about like kind of hot weather, warm Zinfandel that after you work in it for about two years, you realize I'd rather do and work with any other type of grape. And I kept I'm coming surprised. Up with- I'm surprised. Hot weather, warm Zinfandel. I'm surprised it took you two years because I would imagine having that. <laughs> yeah, having, 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 yeah, maybe two months. It's like, okay, I've had enough Zin. Right, right, right. So, um, and Zin is, you know, I love good Zin and kind of cooler weather Zin, but some of these warmer regions, it's just, um, you know, there's a little bit more party out there in the Sierra Nevada foothills. We went from free tasting to $5 tasting and people lost their damn minds. It was <laughs> like the world was ending. So uh, kept coming out to Napa. And um, one of the wines that I always remembered from my restaurant days was cask cabernet uh and at the time it was produced by nebom coppola and i was always a big godfather fan so the fact that francis coppola you know owned a winery out here there was all the godfather stuff out here it was one of my favorite places to visit and cask cabernet if anyone wants to do a google research the old cask used to have a very noticeable label it was he made it with barrel stave wood it was a sticker and it looked like the barrel head and interesting so it was super unique and i loved it and i kept going back and i kind of made a joke with one of the managers there because he's like oh you're this young kid from sacramento that keeps coming out here you know once a month um i was like yeah when you're ready to hire me just let me know and he's like you've worked in amador for two years we could get you a job and i was like where, well i manage where where was i mean where was this winery because I and people in the chat, let me know if you've been to Coppola. I've never been to Coppola. Oh, wow. So it's in Rutherford. So kind of dead center of Napa Valley. Um, okay. But very common, I guess I'll kind of go back. There is the Francis Ford Coppola wine and winery that you get in every marketplace, every restaurant, every wine shop. That is actually moved in the last 20 years over to Geyserville. Uh, in Sonoma. Okay, that's what I'm thinking of. That's what I'm, yeah, way up north off of 101. Um, right. Yeah, okay, I'm with you there. So when I started working there and I moved to Napa in 2006, it was called Niebaum Coppola, taking the mm-hmm. original name of the founder of the estate, Gustav Niebaum, who was a Finnish sea captain who started this winery in 1882, marrying it with his last name, Coppola, made it Niebaum Coppola. And Coppola, Francis, lived in the, in in here he lives in rutherford he's this is the family estate this is where his kids were raised um and when i was working there he decided to change the name to rubicon estate after which was his flagship wine 
He then moved, he purchased the old Chateau Sovereign. Now we're getting into like Napa history. He moved no. all the Godfather and all the Dracula and all the movie paraphernalia out of there. And he just wanted to focus on super high end wines at the Rutherford estate. So we just started making five wines. I worked there for about two years. And then rumor was starting that he was going to repurchase, repurchase the original name of the property, which was Inglenook. Now, right. If what on this chat is 65 and older inglenook is the name of a jug wine that was produced back in the 50s 60s 70s that was made into you know dollar bottom shelf right. carlos and, that, and that's Christian that's exactly jug. the wine that you stole from your friend's parents and that i stole from my <laughs> friend's parents I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of that one thing one thread i i did not know i did not know he purchased chateau Souffrain. Silverine, yes. So, oh, Silverine. Okay. Okay. Silverine, yeah. So that that Coppola actually just last year sold it, um, and he is no longer um, going to be. They're still going to use his naming rights, um, but it was actually sold to one of the conglomerates because he was trying. As Francis is get, getting older now, he's in his eighties. Uh, he wanted to pass it down to Roman and Sophia, his two kids, but they are definitely more in the movie film writing sure. genre which is kind of where he made his money obviously with dracula yep. uh, uh you know all the godfather series and now he does kind of small production stuff but um anyways i loved it when he announced that he was going to change the name to inglenook i kind of thought okay this is now going on three years of working here it's the third name of a winery in three years and I just can't tell this story over and over and over anymore. Um, so I I was looking for other opportunities. I'd kind of moved my way up to trade ambassador and I was taking care of um, a lot of the kind of the higher end clientele, but there was nowhere else for me to go. And I got an opportunity at Minor Family Winery. So I okay. went to Minor Family, managed Minor Family for six years and I loved it. It was a little bit of kind of rock and roll and party. Uh, they make a ton of different wines. Miner's a great kind of value brand. I say value just because they have a lot of wines from like $25 to $75, which for Napa is definitely a value brand. And I uh, love my time there. But I kept seeing this big construction project happening on Silverado Trail about two, uh, you know, uh, maybe 10 minutes north of Miner. And then it was finally done. You know, you're seeing this construction happening. And then I got word that they were doing like a soft opening, like industry party. And I came here and I met Jessica Link, our president. And uh, walking around, my jaw is just on the ground with exactly what's in your background, Martin. The property here is absolutely insane um mike howard mike hired mike davis our owner he hired howard bakken who is kind of napa valley's frank lloyd wright he did a lot of the really famous super high-end wineries out here like la Coya, harlan promontory a lot of the high-end resorts like meadowwood and Salage. and so you know he took the time took the effort six years of construction of building his dream retirement job and uh, another thing where if you're ever falling in love with somewhere and you want to work somewhere, it happened twice for me, just kind of mention to whoever's in charge, I'd love to work here one day. <laughs> but it happened. So I came on um, in 2018, um, been here now going on six years. Um, and I, my, my title is director of hospitality. I do about half my job here at the winery, half my job. I travel the country. I do road shows. I go to uh, people's homes and do private dinners. I'll go to country clubs. I'll go to. But it's. I mean, it's funny because uh, Dave Miner, great guy, um, Chicago Midwestern guy, and yep. likes to play guitar. Likes to have a lot of fun. Uh, you know, great fisherman, great outdoor person, just super into the hospitality. So I could definitely see why the two of you clicked. So when you're when you're walking this property and your jaw is agape and which is, you know, if you're looking for a job, it's that makes it a very tough negotiating on salary because everyone knows that you want the job. But <laughs> tell me what you pitched Mike Davis on as it relates to hospitality, because you're the director of hospitality. So how did you weave? You know, hospitality is just not pressing flesh, shaking hands and doing stuff like that. There, there's a lot of thematic things that have to go on there's there's 
everything that it relates to the entire customer experience from the minute they hit the door uh, and the tasting salons and stuff like that. What was your experience and what was your desire to uh, inculcate into Mike and the staff there on why this is going to be an extraordinary opportunity and for, for hospitality? Yeah, I think for me, it was my background in both restaurants, a kind of small family winery in Amador, a very large theatrical production, which everything is thought about perfect setup from Coppola, the guy's a movie Mm -hmm. director, to then Minor, which I had come on well after that winery had been established. But what Dave was trying to do with me there was kind of take it from kind of a rock and roll value price to a little bit more luxury. So I had, I had really pride myself on building a brand and getting it kind of to this higher level. And, um, you know, I interviewed, I, I met Mike, you know, again, and my big thing on hospitality is I think, uh, especially a lot of your viewers that have that have come out to Napa a lot of times, we've all had that tasting experience with kind of, the old guy that's been out here for years and he doesn't have energy and he does, he like his job and there's a spiel. So my thing and how I train people and how I hire people is there is no spiel. We can give you little nuggets of information, but it has to be a conversation. People are paying absorbent amounts of money to come to Napa Valley. And I don't know what everyone wants to learn about. I can go right place talking about, chemistry, vineyards, winemaking, uh, barrel Barrel regimen. Yeah. literally, There's so much stuff to talk about, but sometimes we get people here that save up their whole entire lives to come to Napa once. Sometimes we have people here that have been to 400 out of the 500 wineries and they're mentioning wineries that I've never even heard of. And I've lived out here for 20 years. So every single demonstration, every single customer interaction, you have to customize it. And so that that was kind of, that's my idea of hospitality and pitch is like, you have to be able to start a conversation with somebody and know within these social cues, like, what does this person want to talk about? Because at the end of the day, juice is juice and we all love juice, but this is about camaraderie, fun, family, friends, people. When you think about your best wine drinking moments, it's not about the juice. It's about the people and the love and the things you're doing and the places you're at. And that's unless unless you're doing it over a bottle of jug wine. Um, but then <laughs> right, 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 right. Let me pause there for a second because I want to say a little a couple of people. David Young, oh, I'm not supposed to say last names, but David and I go way back. And I also see wine extraordinaire maker on the Sonoma side, Elaine Sale is on. So sipsters give it up for Elaine. Uh, Ivy is here. Jay Dean, I haven't seen in a while. Jan, two Jans, three Jans, Julie F and Karen. So good to see you. Uh, by the way, I said that the uh, bottle of late harvest would be gone. It's gone. So LP, I'm going to, going to nickname you there. Nancy. Hello, Rick Martz. Hello, Scotland, Scotland. Uh, I don't know if you've looked at the NCAA basketball brackets yet, but I don't see IU. What I do see for the first time, in my life is Colorado state at 13. So I don't know, you know, um, that, that doesn't happen. So IU is not in the top 25. Sorry about that. Susan Jensen, uh, side note, Pete, I don't get to brag about Colorado state sports ever. So, uh, the fact that we're 13th in the nation, I thought it was a typo and I thought I was looking at the women's NCAA, but, um, nope, the men. So all of you, thank you so much for joining Elaine. Great to see you. So Pete, you come here six years ago to this magical property behind me. And, and I don't say that lightly. Uh, Mission Control and I have been to a lot of properties in the Valley. Many of you that were on the Ask Martin Anything episode a month or two ago, where you said, how many trips to Napa have you had? And the answer was over 60. So I, I've been to a lot of wineries. Uh, Jan Kiefer was at this. Jan K, I'm sorry. Uh, don't worry, Jan. Witness Protection does not know it's the same Jan. Um, this property behind me is, is, is amazing because Pete talked about the architect. And, and Pete can probably tell the story better than I do with regards to what Mike Davis told the architect that he wanted to spend. And so the architect, he said, you know, one of those negotiating things across the table, why don't you write down the figure that you want to spend? And, you know, Mike slid it across the table and he looked at it and started laughing. And then so Mike stopped the story with me there. And later on in the afternoon, I asked him, I said, so how close did you 
get to that figure that you wanted to spend. And and I don't know what the actual truth is, Pete, but what Mike told me is is seven. I said, seven what? He goes, I spent seven times more than I was supposed to spend on the winery. So it's it's insane. Why don't you talk a little bit about the estate? Uh, because I do want people to go there. You, you should all go to this estate uh, and see it. Just walk the grounds. Go in and book a tasting experience with Pete, and he'll make certain that you have an amazing time. But but walk folks through the experience, Pete, on what they're going to see when they get to the estate. Yeah, so the property here, um, it's a pretty large property, 160 acres. It had been farmed before the Davis family, you know, bought it. Um, and that that family had just they were great growers. And the only thing that was here was a kind of a three bedroom house from, you know, the 60s. And then this. Um, this barn and the barn uh, had predated that family, the historic barn. It goes back 1916 and it's actually a registered historical landmark for Calistoga. And when Mike cool. came, was looking at properties, um, he just kind of fell in love with this barn, but the back wall was kind of rotting out because it was where they used to hang the meat before refrigeration. The, it needed to do foundation. It was kind of leaning to one side. There was holes in it. And um, the family that he bought it from named Savier, they had made a little bit of wine on site just kind of for friends and family, but they really weren't into hosting guests. But sure. you know, all this really cool um, artifacts from the barn were in there, some old casks. And he said, this is such a cool potential um, to kind of have as my inspiration for the rest of the property. Um, and so the first thing they had to do was kind of move this barn. So they, they, they cut it off its foundation. They raised the foundation about a foot. They put it on big wheels and kind of moved it about 40 yards. And then this was all happening, uh, under construction right after the Napa earthquake happened, which was 2013, oh, 2014, yeah, 2013, so 2014. Yeah. So Mike ended up, essentially, it's a steel structure. It's like he built a steel building within the barn. So so three sides of the barn are kind of original, as much of original that wasn't, you know, molded and rotted out. But um, a lot of the cross beams are the same. So new roof, new windows, new back wall. But um, the historic barn is kind of what makes a lot of people fall in love with the property. And, um, oh, there it is. Yeah, look at that and uh um, mission control on the ball <laughs> love it so um this is kind of it, it right now it's our event space we also um it had a little bit of fire damage just on the edges and we can talk about that in a little bit uh in the 2020 fire but it is now also kind of doubles as a tasting room space but we can do dinners up to 100 people in there we do wine club events we do um you know, private buyouts. It's and then it's a super cool space. I mean, it's there's I don't know half a dozen or more like little tasting vignettes where you can go in and, and sit at a bar. You can sit the the video interview we did sipsters for the interview with me myself and Mike Davis is in the barn, so it's it's pretty cool sitting alongside uh, some so much memorabilia in there. But it's a great area to do a tasting uh, from an experience like that. It's a super cool place. Yep. And then what's behind you is actually the, the main tasting room, that little brick foundation there. They started with the cave and all the cave rock that came out uh, while we were drilling the cave, uh, they built this foundation. So that behind you was just a dirt hill. There was nothing there. And um, which is probably one of the reasons why it took six years is, um, you know, 12,000 square feet of caves, retrofitting a barn, building that building from the ground up. Um, and, and Mike really wanted the focus to be about food and wine. It's not just about wine. It's it's about hospitality. It's about friends, family, food, wine. So all of our experiences have some type of food component with it. Uh, and how do, you, how do you decide that? How, and, and why did you decide that? I think wine tastes better with food. I mean, if the French and Italian have taught us anything, it's that you know, you got to embrace this with a meal. You know, I think that the it's, American- it's so, it's so funny you say that too, because in America, and there's nothing wrong with this, you know, in America, we will go, hey, you want to go have a glass of wine and, and it's perfectly normal and we'll go have a glass of wine. 
in France or Italy, you ask someone that and you want to go have a glass of wine, they'll say, what are we eating? Right. Because it's so inextricably linked. They, they can't have one without the other from the minute they came onto the planet. So it's, you're right. And, but it was, I think it's fascinating that you guys decided from the get go, this is going to be a food and wine experience and, you know, run through how you've brought that to life. Well, the first thing is the tasting room itself. Um, the, we kind of, the centerpiece for the tasting room is a massive shelf kitchen with a, a very cool pizza oven kind of uh, built in. So, um, you know, the the idea is keep it, at, you know, total California, farm fresh, seasonal as possible. We change that menu every six weeks because we have people visiting from across the country. We also have tons of members from Napa, San Francisco, um, the Bay Area. Oh, there it is. Mission Control. Look at that. So that is the main tasting room and just kind of one side of it. So you're watching our chef team, you know, create what you're about to eat. And and so many tasting experiences are cheese and charcuterie. Well, right. um, we know that prosciutto goes with pinot <laughs> and steak, you know, you know, aged beef goes with cab. We know that. Um, there's science on that. So we wanted it to be more about that. So everything is hot food. Everything changes every six weeks. It's a collaboration between myself and chef. And it's it's kind of a unique setup where normally in a food and wine experience, you either decide what you're going to eat or drink kind of first, and then you go the other way. I actually give the chef, hey, these are the wines that I have enough of to pour and sell. Now you have to make me dishes or make our guest dishes. Um, right. That, that makes sense with this. And so it's a very fun process because every six weeks, myself, Jessica, Brandon Davis, who is Mike's son, uh, who works with us as well. We all yep. sit down kind of in, collab in collaboration with our chef and we're tasting everything. And, you know, we talk about portion, we talk about salt, acid, proteins, fat, everything that can change your palate, portion size, um, and we go back and forth. And sometimes if a dish is rocking and we love it, maybe we change the wine, you know, mm. we're, we're, we're at a unique spot where we make not a ton of wine. You know, I like to say eight to 12,000 cases, but 17 SKUs, which right. is a lot. We actually kind of don't focus on wholesale distribution. It's really only found here at the winery. So it's fun because we have this kind of palette or paintbrush to uh, our paint set to play with, and we can really have fun with it. And that's something great well, about that, being a small family winery. I think it's it's phenomenal. And I, and I love what you've done. And I love how food and that experience, uh, by the way, you're not going to be in and out of a Davis estate tasting in under 30 minutes. So don't, don't think that you're just going to breeze in, taste three wines and, and skedaddle. Not going to happen. Shouldn't happen, by the way. So- but the tasting experience is outstanding. Let's walk through now the wine of the evening, the after or the late harvest wine that you're not making any more of. The 2014 was the last vintage. But before we talk about that, you know, you worked at the restaurant and you used to uh, put bottles aside as a busser and stuff like that. So, you know, as I mentioned, we're going to focus on four after dinner wines. And, but the last one that we're going to talk about is yours. So Boitritis, Noble Rot, uh, those wines are pretty special. They're pretty special on the, on the bank account as well. Um, wh why are they so expensive? Wh why is, why is this so uh, romanticized and just so highly sought after? Time and labor. I mean, it is so expensive to make this stuff and it doesn't matter what dessert wine you're talking about, whether it's late harvest, um, you know, something like, you know, using Botrytis or Noble Rot, whether you're talking about Port, whether you're talking about Madeira, you know, all these wines have so much extra time and effort packaging. And it's not like people are coming into the winery and buying a case of dessert wine, that's, you know, a great buying one or two. Um, so it's, it's a special thing that, um, you know, it's also, 
sorry, ADD. It's also kind of a, um, a polarizing thing. People tend to either love dessert wines or they just go, nope, I don't drink sweet wine. I don't drink uh, dessert wine. And my answer to that is, no, you just haven't had either any good ones or the right one for you. Because there's so many different levels of sweetness right. and so many different levels of, you know, red, white, tawny, you know, whatever, uh, that every, every wine geek out there has or the ones that are willing to open up their their palate to unique things, which I implore all drinkers to, they have one special kind of dessert wine that they really gravitate towards. Yep. No, I agree. And it's funny, you talk about Boitritis and you talk about Noble Rot. And we did a, I encourage people to go back and find that episode on SIP because we we did a this is probably two years ago, and we did a bunch of Google Earth stuff on Noble Rot, specifically kind of showcased uh, Chateau de Kim. And, and it's fascinating from, you talk about time and labor, and you're right, those are the two main factors in how expensive these things are. But specifically as it rates, relates to the regions producing a Noble Rot or Boitritis wine, you have to have the environment conditions to get the disease. And sometimes it might not have enough humidity, so the rot doesn't form. And so you're kind of, you're totally at the whim of Mother Nature, which throws in another curveball that you can't anticipate. Uh, we talked about, or you mentioned uh, port. So port is another one of those wines that's crazy time consuming, labor intensive. And we haven't even talked about the ageability of port. And, and you start going on some of the wine websites or auction sites, there's ports from the 1800s that they're auctioning off. It, it It's insane. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, some of my most memorable wines are, you know, drinking stuff from the 1800s and realizing like this was 40 year, 40 years before cars. <laughs> you right. know, like, they, they were harvesting this in horse and buggy and the airplane was many decades from being invented. That to me- That's incredible. You're drinking history, you know? And, and you know, whether you like it or not, um, I honestly think it doesn't matter. I mean, you're literally tasting history. It, it's- Yeah, it's so and I, I, think, I think that's probably the best way to describe it. And it's- it's funny because in your area and, you know, over in Sonoma where they, they do a little bit more Zinfandel and you hear about these ancient vines and these old vines and stuff. And, and when you've got hundred year old vines and, and things from the 1800s, you are drinking history and it, it's, it's something to behold. And it may not be your, it may not knock you off your feet type of thing, but boy, soak it in because there was a lot of things that have happened since that time that we we take for granted, like you mentioned, the airplane, the automobile. We've put people on the moon. These vines were growing long before that. So let's let's talk about the late harvest you don't produce anymore. Sure. So the 2014. Uh, first of all, this is Cabernet Franc. Uh, talk to us about Cabernet Franc. Yeah. So Cabernet Franc right now um, is a very uh, I hate to say hip and trendy, but it has gotten a ton of momentum in Napa Valley. Uh, when I moved out here 20 years ago, it was just kind of a blending grape. Uh, there was a few vineyards with it, but you really didn't see people focus on it. Well, the last 10, 15 years have changed, and there's a lot of wineries out here that um, kind of for the first time ever are ripping out Cabernet Sauvignon and planting more Cabernet Franc, which that is something that is definitely um, changed uh, out here in, sure. in the last uh, few years. So Cabernet Franc, you know, it, it's typically known uh, for being a little bit more on the red fruit side uh, as compared to the dark fruit side of Cabernet Sauvignon. And, and a couple of things about Cabernet Franc is everyone that says, oh, you know, Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon is king, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon is what we're talking about. Well, Cabernet Franc, the grandparent of Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, is kind of the OG Cabernet, you know, <laughs> back, uh, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the most popular wine in the world, was only really invented or created 400, 500 years ago by cross-pollinating, well, not cross-pollinating, but crossing uh, Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. So that's how right. Cabernet Sauvignon is born. 
But Cabernet Franc, typically in a dry style, is known for more red fruit, a lot of pyrazines, those bell pepper, jalapeno, tomato stem, green herb, kind of walk in an herb garden type of flavors. Um, and when you're when you treat it right, it can be super unique and it can age just like Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, it gives you structure like Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, but it just it doesn't quite have as much dark fruit. It doesn't have quite as much tannin. Um, but Cabernet Franc is one of my personal favorite grapes. Um, and I collect it like crazy. And I wish that it wasn't hip and trendy because when I started out here 20 years ago, it was the same price as Merlot. And now you really can't find a Napa Cab Franc for maybe under 80 bucks. Well, and, and you being in St. Helena, there was a, a friend of Cellar Angels, Jeff Orlick, who owned the Black Rock Inn, um, off, uh, the trail that used to have a Frank off every year. If you, you may remember it, uh, if you attended it, most people didn't remember it because there was hundreds of bottles of Cabernet Franc that were opened. And I agree with you. When we used to sell at Cab Franc at the store in Chicago, I thought it was hit or miss. Uh, you know, not too dissimilar to Carmenere uh, and, and some of the ones to where if it's picked too early or if it hasn't fully ripened, you do get a lot of those green vegetal fruits on it. And that, that bell pepper, which for me is off-putting. Some people love bell pepper, but when you, to your point, and I can very easily understand and, and empathize with you, have it, how it could be your favorite wine. When you find one that's produced right, and 20 years ago, it was the QPR of that was insane with regards to what the price was, boy, it will knock you off your feet. It has nuance and layer upon layer of flavor and structure and acid and body balance. And you, you swear it's not Cabernet Franc, you swear it's something else and it's so good. So I'm not going to ask you to name producers, but I'm sure Davis is one of them. So on this, given your hospitality chops, what would you guys have paired with this? And, and what should someone that is serving a late harvest wine think about from a pairing perspective? Yeah, well, this is pretty synonymous with how you would treat a Ruby port. Um, you know, for me, there's can you a, can you just explain the difference between Ruby and Tawny? I can. Um, I'm a little <laughs> for me, um, it gets down to aging and then also the blending of different grapes. Um, you know, I think that people either like kind of one or the other, but typically Ruby Port, you're gonna get all like just kind of red fruit flavors where okay. Tawny tend to get a lot more kind of caramelization, a little bit more nuttiness, a little bit yep. more kind of depth of flavor, rounded flavor. And well you know, done. It, yeah, I mean, just I tend to gravitate toward a little bit more tawny, but um, I also like Madeira and other kind of more nuttier style of dessert wines. Um, you know, there's there's no right or wrong with it though. This is all sure. just personal preference. Um, so when you think about using something like this, as far as application, the classic pairings on something like port would be like, um, well, first of all, whenever you're doing port, if you're going to actually pair it, one rule of thumb for me, port like wines, late harvest, typically the dessert should be a little bit sweeter than the wine. And okay. sometimes if the wine is too sweet and the, the dish is, you know, not as sweet, when you go from wine to food to dessert back to the wine, you can get some bitterness on the palate. Mm. So, you know, the key to aging and all this and, and holding this wine up and why it's still tasting good nine years later is the acidity. Um, the acidity is kind of holding this wine up. So I always would do something like you think about red fruits and dark fruit desserts, but also chocolates. So flourless chocolate cake, um, brownies with raspberries or blackberries on top, blackberry pie. Um, I love drizzling this over just vanilla ice cream. Anything with like a crumble, you can use this as kind of like almost like a syrup or like a little sweetening agent because right. to me, you know, it's sweet, it's refreshing. I You can kind of see my glass. I'm using one of these little kind of whiskey snifters, but 
you know, I think a very common mistake is people giving themselves a six ounce pour of port or late harvest. You definitely Guilty. don't need to do that. Uh, how you drink this is just a little sip of uh, wine on your tongue. And then I kind of swish it all around and get it in kind of full palate mode. Okay, while all of you are taking a sip of your dessert wine and swishing it all around, I'm going to launch a poll question. So we talked about Davis Estates and this wine here is a late harvest. The world's largest producer of ice wine is located where? Switzerland, Canada, Iceland, or Denmark? And an ice wine, I showed a picture of it earlier. And to Pete's point, you want to talk about labor and time and intensity. If When you look at the moisture content of a grape, as it's on the vine longer and longer and longer and after harvest, and then much later after harvest, it starts to shrivel up like a raisin. So as a result, there's less fluid in that, in that grape. So when you think about ice wines... They pick these typically when they're frozen. And so they're not going to get a lot of droop, a droop, a lot of drops of wine out of the grape, a lot of fluid. So it takes a ton of clusters to produce a very, very small amount of wine. So it's it's amazing that they even can get this sort of stuff, which is why they serve it in smaller bottles, which is why they have it in smaller pours, because you're, you're not just, to uh, Pete's point, you're not just pouring a five ounce glass of dessert wine, uh, because that's half the bottle for the most part. Uh, David, very good. Uh, I'm going to end this poll and the correct answer, nine of you had it correct, is in fact Canada. So the Inniskilling Company uh, is the largest producer of ice wine in the world. And it's a, I think it's made from the Vidal grape, not Sassoon, but uh, spelled the same, V-I-D-A-L. And I just dated myself because 80% of the people don't know who Vidal Sassoon is. Uh, but uh, that's fine. Let's go on to the second poll question. And we talked a little bit about this earlier, Chateau de Kim. So Chateau de Kim, uh, smartphones down, people. I can see you over there. Is made from what two grapes? Concord, Tro yes, Mission Control. Concord, Trollinger, Semillon and Chardonnay, Riesling and Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. Chateau de Kim is produced in France, in Bordeaux. This is one of those wines that we talked about, noble rot. So Boitritis is the disease that is actually in these grapes that they desire. So not every year is perfect condition for Boitritis. You have to have a certain amount of wind, a certain amount of sun, a certain amount of humidity. It's damp. And so you have to have this mildew on the grapes. It's incredible. Uh, nectar of the gods, I think, is the most often uttered phrase with regards to Dekim. Uh, all right, five, four, three, two, one. Check out how smart these sipsters are. Pretty impressive. 12 of you, Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. Now for extra credit, write in essay question, what percentage? You can write that in the chat. Percentage of the Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, I'll take all answers. Uh, I do want to show folks, uh, Pete, where you're located. So I'm going to jump right to uh, Google Earth. And Dahlia, you're correct. There's nothing wrong with liking both Ruby and Tawny. Um, I'm a big fan of liking both. So, all right. If any of you that know this part of the broadcast, recognize our little spinning orb here. Uh, for the better part of 13 years and 149 episodes all we do is we focus on napa and snow mat cellar angels whoopsie opus isn't supposed to be there where'd my napa county line go hang on ah there we go all right so here's the region that we call home actually pete calls it home we call it home metaphorically uh this is something of an anomaly when it comes to wine regions, and most of the sipsters know it's it's because of the climate here, classified as a Mediterranean climate. Uh, less than 3% of the globe is a Mediterranean climate. So when you think about that alone, it's unique. But the soils that they have here are also, they've got 13 of the, I think, 30 different subsoil species in the world are found in these two regions. Uh, you have 
17 different AVAs in Napa, 17 different AVAs in Sonoma. A little bit Hatfield and McCoy there because the minute one gets a new AVA, the other one gets all kind of flushed and says, well, we got to get another AVA. So there's a little bit of that going on. Um, but it is pretty impressive that you've got 17 and now maybe 18, don't quote me, different American viticultural areas that are so unique that the government has classified them as distinct among just this county. Typically, that has to do with topography, microclimate, soil structure, elevation, and aspect. There is actually one AVA, it's the only one, where it is based upon the wind. Uh, so it's pretty cool from that standpoint. No other region in the world has this type of diversity, which is why winemakers from around the globe flock to start producing wine here. It's very, very special. Now, I want to show you kind of in relation to what's happening, Napa Valley. And... Here you've got the city of Napa, and I, I threw Opus here, not because they're a paid sponsor. They haven't done a dime with us in, in 13 years. I have no idea who runs that winery, uh, but send. it doesn't matter if you're going to send cease and desist letters. That's done. Um, this just gives you an idea of where Opus is located. We've all driven by it on Route 29 at one point in time. But if you can see, I don't know if I'm going to pull it down a little bit, just what I talked about how far north in the Valley Davis was. See that blinking thumbtack up there? It's a ways up valley. So when you move past and go up Route 29, you can still see there's some major topography influence here. Yeah, they're near the valley floor, clearly, as evidenced by the picture, but they're at the edge of the foothills. And there's some steep hills behind where I'm sitting uh, and that has to, a lot to do with erosion and what's going on in the soils down here. You also have the Napa River. So they're kind of between two geological forces. You've got the erosion from wind and weathering elements coming off the mountain that pulls all of the material and sediment down here. But then this river floods, you know, every 50 years, every 100 years. And you do that through a millennia. There's a ton of diverse soil in, in rock structures and shells and different nutrients in here that then lend itself to the vines and the grapes and the clusters, which again, which is what makes this area so wonderfully unique. Uh, that's from the backside of Davis, but you can also come around to the front and there you get a really good picture of, of the mountains that are influenced, not only with the erosion that I talked about in the soils, but also the wind and and the shade and, and sun aspect throughout the day. So how the orientation of the vines has to be taken into consideration based upon where the property sits. Uh, last but not least, you can kind of get up close and personal. And it's just a picture picturesque property that uh, is really something to behold. I'm going to go down here on the street because uh, I can. And when you see it from here, gives you a little bit better perspective of, of just the hillsides behind you. Um, that You have vines on hills here, vines behind the winery. The winery sits up against this mountain, if you will. And so what Pete was talking about earlier about the caves, uh, the caves go into the mountain. Bless you. And it's something that is, other wineries have caves, you know, that's fine, but they don't have these caves. I, I, I'm telling you, they don't have these caves. Uh, it is a sight to be seen. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you are so inclined to join and keep me honest here, Pete, the High End Wine Club, they will take your hand imprint and you will be able to unlock the vault with your hand. And when you walk in, it plays the song you want to have playing. And, uh, and, and it's not on eight track like I requested. So uh, it's it's a special, special place. And it's I mean, I can't say enough about it. I, first of all, I love Calistoga. Uh, I love going up there. It's off the beaten path. You're out of the valley, so to speak. You're, you're up valley. It's warmer. Keep in mind, it, it'll be warmer than down in Coombsville throughout the day and, and that area. So bear that in mind. But boy, it is something special. And this winery is doing everything right. And that starts uh, with our, tonight's guest and the hospitality. Oh, thank you. Um yeah, everything you said is totally spot on. I love the fact that we're kind of away from the crowds. You know, right. we're Silverado Trail is, you know, there's those two parallel roads that go up. Highway 29 is where you have all your really kind of name brand ones that get distributed all around the country. Robert Mondavi, Opus, 
um turnbull uh Behringer, charles cake Kirk, bread sterling cake bread yeah all those none guys. of them are sponsors no paid sponsors <laughs> there. but um the silverado trail side you know it's all kind of by appointment you know it's a lot more kind of small families and um it's nice working in previous jobs where i just saw so many people um here a very very busy saturday for us in peak season we're going to be seeing about 70 or 80 people but we just do three different seatings per day so 20 people in the building at one time max so and it's a big building yeah you're not going to run into anybody yeah you're all spread out so People sometimes call and they're like, we want to stop by for a quick and easy bar tasting. It's like, that's not what we do. Um, no. so if any of you guys are stopping by and you give me a call, I'd be happy to give you a splash. But to get the full experience, um, you know, anywhere from 90 minutes to two and a half hours is what we kind of ask for the different levels of things that we do, because there's so much to see. Um and, you know, I want you to come and visit and I want to uh, ruin too many surprises for you. But um, we we see we have a lot of like inner winery or uh, trade members with us because we're kind of their favorite secret winery. We don't do a ton of marketing and advertising just through right. somebody like Seller Angels um, because we want to keep it kind of quiet and special and and not um somewhere where you're gonna see bachelorettes or tour buses <laughs> <laughs> groups everything online says six or less six or less but really the focus is two uh, groups of two and four and it's funny you actually basically just kind of described that uh, the matriculation process of tasting experiences that we've been talking about for 15 20 years where you're right the first time people go to the valley they're only on 29 they don't even know silverado trail exists and they're looking at all of the ones like, hey, I know that one. I know, I know that one too. I know, and they're and they're all the ones that are distributed. So okay, that's fine. The second time they go, they do kind of hit one of the side streets and make their way over to Silverado Trail, and and then they start going up and down the trail. And yeah, they might see they might see Minor, and and maybe they recognize Minor for something. They might ha might see they go a little bit further up the trail and see Quintessa, and they're like, well, hang on, I had Quintessa at a restaurant, and. But you pretty soon you're running into a whole bunch of wineries that you had no idea they existed. They're incredibly small. They don't have mass distribution. And then it's your third trip. Usually trips three through 20. You're you're in someone's garage. You're thieving wine out of a barrel. You're, you're like, well, how have I never heard of you? And the person says, well, I only make 250 cases of Cabernet yeah. and it's all from the estate right here. And that's kind of when you get bit and you realize, holy cow, there's a whole world of wine out there that I had no idea existed. We we have a sign, but all of our neighbors next to us are like, turn right at the yellow mailbox. Yeah. Here's my gate code. Don't worry about the dog that's going to run out and greet you. <laughs> yes. And that's the way the tasting should be. Uh, so I don't fault anybody for going to those tasting rooms that you learned about, I mean, I think pretty much everybody starts there where you're six deep at a tasting room and you've got a tasting sheet and stuff like that. And that's okay to get your feet wet, but there's a whole nother side of the Valley to explore. And, you know, there's, I, I lost count. There might be 13, 14, 1500 commercially licensed wineries, but there's only about 300 that have national distribution. So that leaves you about 1100 wineries that may not distribute outside the state or outside of a few select states where they have got relationships and distribution. There's a lot to explore kids. Uh, and, and this is one where you should stop, get up Valley ASAP and uh, book a tasting at Davis Estates. And Pete's right. Uh, 90 minutes should be the minimum that you taste here. And you, and you really shouldn't want to cram anything in because there's so much to see. Uh, not the least of which are these swinging benches that or couches that hold about 1600 pounds. It's uh, that little veranda behind you or kind of screened in patio. Um, yeah, you can kind of see on the back there that we have swinging couches and we do food and wine pairings out there. But the view out the front, you're looking at amazing sunsets pretty much every day. And um, there's just something really peaceful about Napa, as I'm sure a lot of your your viewers here have been there. I loved it so much. I had to work, you know, work and just make a career out of it. And now people are like, what's next? Where are you going? And I'm like, well, I I love and respect my boss. 
I'm at a really cool brand that, you know, I love the wine. I love the people. The management team's been together for the six years that I've been here. Like, I don't know if there is a next for me. No, <laughs> I'm yeah, kind of you're, happy. You're in a pretty good spot right there. And, and Pete's right. Where we're looking at this picture behind me, you're looking east. When you get to sit on those couches and face west at three, four, or five o'clock during the golden hour, so to speak, the sunset over the mountains is incredible. So I definitely encourage you to do that. Pete, this has been awesome. I'm so glad that you're able to kind of walk us through the Davis portfolio and certainly spend a little bit of time on after dinner wines, specifically late harvest. Uh, this one is exceptional. I'm glad we have one more bottle. Uh, Sipsters, you may have read the email that this is our second to last sip that we are shutting or hanging up our angel wings for a time being December 31st. Uh, we have one more sip left. It'll be sip episode 150. That is next Friday night. Uh, there will be no educational content. Many of you have claimed that there's been no educational content ever. It's just been a very poorly written show. So uh, thank you for the viewer mail. Uh, but Next week, it is kind of cameras on. So if you want to show up, uh, I'm not saying it's clothing optional because it is a holiday party. It's a pajama party. I'm also not not saying it's clothing optional. So take that for what it's worth. Um, it is going to be a very, very festive show, as always. Uh, and for the last 13 years, last 149 episodes, none of this happens without your dedication to the small limited production winery and your love for these wines. So can't thank you enough for that. Uh, Pete, you've been a rock star to stay with us on a Friday night. I know you've got uh, things to do and tend to. So thanks for walking us through everything Davis Estates related and certainly the late harvest. Of course. Yeah. Everyone come and visit. This isn't the only wine that we make. We do um, and oh, check yeah. out our site. Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay. We're kind of, you know, we do focus on Bordeaux varietals, but um, 17 SKUs, a lot of different single AVA cabs. And um, yeah, you're not going to find us in a lot of uh, grocery stores and restaurants. So um, utilize me, shoot me an email, come call, ask for me. I can set you up with some of my favorite little neighbors that you'll never hear about. Or, or And that's or how it happens, ladies and gentlemen. That's the spirit of giving. And it's the most amazing thing. And I've said it for years about this industry. If I go into Home Depot and they're out of a tool and ask them, where can I get it? They're going to be like, I don't know. They aren't going to send me to Lowe's. But if I ask Pete, it's four o'clock in the afternoon and we just got done with tasting, where else should I go? He's legitimately, authentically going to tell me several places where I'm going to have a kick behind experience and it's legit. That's why this valley is so special and that's why this industry rocks. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Talk soon. David, did we get your question answered? Did we get David's question answered? Okay. He was just waving. Awesome. All right. Want to be thorough. Pete, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Sipsters, we will see you next Friday night. Sip episode 150. Thanks. Pete. Be good to one another. Cheers. Cheers.